We use the salt gel method uh, more so than the polymer method. A lot of our, uh, we use polymers once in a while. Uh, our competitors all use polymers rather than salt gel. We like salt gel because it's very uh, durable, very robust, and it's essentially glass. It starts as liquid glass with solvents and whatnot, a siloxane solution, uh, which can be easily coated and then cured and just leaves you this porous structure that can be very tailored to whatever uh, application it may need to suit. And as I said, it begins to clear it liquid, uh, just silicon and oxygen, just like glass, uh, and you can add and remove you know, organic ligands and whatnot and the solvents. And these chemical modifiers change things like response time, dynamic range, ionic strength sensitivity. Uh, so, I mean, to answer your question about the low range, just by adding different constituents, we can even use one dye that would normally be a higher range, change the chemistry, and then all of a sudden it starts seeing more in the lower range or the higher range. So you can trick, do a lot of cool tricks with the chemistry uh, on this. And uh, we dissolve some uh, pH responsive molecule, as I said, an indicator dye in that formulation. And then that's aged, coated, and, and cured. I'm going to go more into that in just a bit. So the advantages of salt gel. Uh, there's every type of siloxane imaginable. It's really uh, it's an, a silicon atom with uh, four oxygens. And then uh, you can have different ligands coming off of there. Uh, and you can really add and uh, do anything with it. You can use hydrophilic groups to promote aqueous diffusion. That's what we did with these uh, sensor materials. Excuse me. They, uh, they allow really fast diffusion of the hydronium ions in and out of the coating uh, for really snappy response. Contra contrarily, we can use the uh, hydrophobic groups, and that would hinder aqueous diffusion. That would be something like for uh, ammonia sensing. Um, I looked at that using our pH sensors as an ammonia sensor, uh, specifically by blocking out everything that's not nonpolar block out any sort of polar uh, hydrophilic entities. You can add aromatic groups that softens the coating. We do that to uh, keep it from being too brittle or cracking. Uh, ionic groups uh, add a charge. Uh, that's how we uh, achieve our ionic strength immunity. We, in, we make it so that there is always a charge at the sensing interface, whether or not the analyte has salinity or not. So, And metal salts. This was really interesting. Uh, uh, I did a lot of research on doping rare earth uh, salts, lanthanide uh, compounds, and those uh, dramatically shifted the dynamic range of the sensors and where it was responding. So the list is really, I mean, endless, because anything you can think of to add or remove to this chemistry, you know, you can do at different ratios, different combinations. So it's really a, an art that hasn't been, uh, it's been worked on a lot, but there's still a lot to, to, to be done. The coating's just as versatile. We can change the viscosity for our coating uh, to achieve you know, thinner, thicker, uh, or to accommodate some custom coating application. And this can be spin coated, spray coated, or dip coated. We've had people send us things like marbles and toys to be coated and just random you know, things. So we can coat things how, however you can imagine. So if you have a custom application that you, know, you may think, oh, well, uh, we need a patch or um, just come to us and let us know what, whatever you think may not or may be, be possible because we can really do a lot with this. The, uh, the chemistry too can be tailored to adhere uh, to things like metals or plastics or, or glass or whatnot. So we chose bromocrystal green, which uh, in water normally has a color change that exhibits between 3.8 and 5.4 uh, pH. But, uh, when we put it in our salt gel formulation, that shifts up uh, to, as I said, between five and nine. So here's some other dyes. There's from Crestle Green. Just to show you, uh, these are other ones that we've worked with. Uh, they're not official products, but they, they could be. You know, uh, the, the ranges are like this one, from Phenol Blue is a little bit to lower range, accommodates down like three and four. Bone Crestle Purple is good up like seven to 11 or so. so. Uh, and look at how similar all these are. All we're changing uh, little things here and there, you know, methyl group here, but not one here, uh, changing bromine to a methyl, things like that. So it's really the base structure, and we can just change things about these dyes, and that also will shift the, uh, the ranges and, and responses and whatnot. Uh, and this is only one family. We haven't even looked into the methyl reds and the whole other families and families of dyes that could be integrated into this chemistry. 
So, Roman Crescent Marine, here's some of the optical properties of it. I wanted to let you guys know and kind of visually, you know, see what's, uh, what's happening and what the, the system is processing to get its pH value. Uh, six, 620 nanometers, we have the base peak. Uh, isobestic point at 510 and then the acid peak down here at 450. We used to look at this peak and this peak and we had an algorithm that looked at both of those, but we found that the noise from here compounded with the noise from there just made it, it wasn't as good as if we just looked at this one peak. So we looked at uh, just 620 and then we have a baseline correction uh, at either the isobestic point, which is there, or we can use something out near the uh, NIR. And that baseline corrects for vertical offset. I don't know how familiar you guys are using uh, uh, absorbance mode, transmissive mode in a uh, spectra suite with dip probes or different optics and whatnot, but if you're looking at some absorbance plot and then move the fibers or knock something, the whole thing shifts up and down, back and, back and forth, but uh, it's uniform, it holds its shape. So to, to correct for that, and uh, that's a couple slides, Forward, uh, we subtract out some baseline for, uh, for that, but uh, you have to really have a, the light source that emits just as strongly at that wavelength so that you're not getting noise also from that baseline correction. And here's a comparison of those dyes that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, Roman phenol blue, Roman crystal purple, Roman crystal green. We use Roman crystal green, it's right middle of the road there. Um, this one here is a little better for the high end and then uh, like I said, the, the Roman Phenol Blue is a little better for the low end, so we can use you know, these different dyes to kind of tweak where those sensitivities fall. Right now there's two pH products that exist in ocean optics, so there's going to be, it's going to expand to probably like four to six in the next couple months here. Because uh, we have a new probe coming out, we have the new reflective patches, we have a lot coming along, but right now we have the transmissive pH patches that are used with the dip probes you guys have in front of you. And we have the smart pH cubettes. And that can be used either desktop or portable. And both of these can actually be used desktop or portable. We can have a system like you guys have with a separate light source and detector and whatever sampling accessory may be necessary. Or you can have a field portable jazz system. But all these setups require a viz spectrometer and either LS1 or LS2 light source. Uh, but you can use any light source, really, that hits on the wavelengths that are necessary. You can use the xenon or, or whatever. So how do we get them into these probes, these T300s? Uh, we spin coat them, uh, spin coat our sensor formulation uh, onto uh, acrylic discs as our spin coater. And then that's fun at several thousand RPM. Uh, leaving a nice thin film, very uniform. Uh, that's our latest and greatest uh, Brewer Scientific Spin Coater, about 10 grandish, and uh, we did a lot of research too into optimizing the spin coating process to have the best uniformity across the disc so that we're not calibrating all the different spots and whatnot. Uh, ambient uh, and thermal cure to complete that process, and then uh, we cut out of the larger 5-inch disc these smaller patches, and these are self-adhesive. Uh, they just uh, stick, peel and stick right onto either the lens or the mirror, or both. Do you have it on both and that doubles your resolution there. And Spark Cubettes is really the uh, same thing. We uh, spin that uh, onto the inner surface. Uh, uh, we have a custom fixture that holds all that, and they're injected, spun, and cured. We flipped and do it on the opposite side. And this one, uh, when we do the cubettes though, since it is sensor to sensor, the cubette to cubette reproducibility isn't as good as you would get if you just had a single disc or multiple discs. So that is more of a, a drawback to that uh, production technique. So a quick theory operation of how it works, uh, which is the setup you guys have, LS1, USB 2000, and a dip probe. Your LS1's outputting some sort of uh, spectra right here, heading down through the fiber, and then that'll interact with the sensor chemistry, and you'll, there'll be some color change, and then that will be fed back to the detector, uh, ready some absorbance value, and then correlated with pH. So system requirements for any of these systems. You need a light source, of course, uh, one that emits strongly at both analytical and baseline wavelength. If you have a light source that's 
super strong at the analytical wavelength, and you're thinking, I'm going to get the best resolution measurement you know, ever. It'll be awesome. But the baseline wavelength has almost no intensity. All of that noise from the baseline is going to then be in your analytical final value. So both of those, uh, both those wavelengths should have good intensity. And likewise, the spectrometer that accommodates those, those wavelengths. For transmissive setups, like these that we have, well, one of them is reflected, but for the probes here, uh, it assumes uh, it's clear and has no sediment. Uh, if it's colored, um, it uh, uh, interferes with that color measurement, obviously. And then if you have sediment in there, that just screws with the uh, optical path and uh, it makes the measurement no good. 